is it ready yes it's started okay so in the last class we looked at uh, different approaches to annotate web pages uh, there we talked about rdfa rdfa lite uh, json ld and uh, then I also mentioned about microdata microformats and series. So in, in, in today, today's class, so we'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk about microdata microformats and SRS. Uh, and then we'll compare uh, the features we, uh, the features we, uh, the features of RDFA, uh, microformats and microdata and SRS. And then I'll introduce you some tools that you can use to annotate your web pages. And with that, we can conclude this chapter. Uh, to recap, uh, RDFA uh, is an ac acronym for Resource Description Framework in Attributes. Uh, we can uh, use that to annotate web pages. Uh, so we discussed uh, the, the use of type of uh, property uh, attributes. Uh, and then we went on and talked about uh, RDFS, uh, uh, sorry, RDFA resource attribute, uh, and uh, how uh, inverse relationships can be modeled using RDFA uh, rev attribute. So, with that introduction, uh, I would like to uh, talk about microdata, which is the second uh, technique technology that we are going to uh, talk about. Uh, my microdata is. It's, a, it's not a standard gate, it's a specification. If you look at RDFA, it's already a standard. And uh, microdata uh, was uh, developed by uh, Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group. And uh, uh, the, the good thing about microdata is that uh, recently, uh, the three leading uh, search, and search service providers, Bing, Yahoo, and Google, they announced that they are going to support uh, microdata, and they came up with this uh, vocabulary called schema.o, which we can use as, uh, as a supporting vocabulary to uh, uh, as a supporting vocabulary uh, to annotate things uh, using microdata format. So, uh, with uh, Google, uh, with the Google's announcement, Google, uh, Bing, and uh, Yahoo's annou announcement uh, on. Uh, they are supporting microdata uh, officially. People started to annotate more and more their web resources using uh, microdata. So they have, uh, there are some groups formed uh, which uh, they advocate or they uh, they tell people how to use schema of vocabularies. And uh, there are if you if you search the internet, you will find plenty of articles talking about. Uh, how to use microdata and how to use schema or vocabulary. So that's one of the good things. Uh, but uh, we have a downside of this too, or, or some uh, some drawbacks of schema too, because uh, schema is not uh, uh, backward compatible. So uh, what I mean by that is, if you uh, so when you uh, the, the the main uh, the main idea behind annotating a web page, uh, you, you try to model some knowledge. So if you look at this example, uh, you try to model uh, knowledge or em embed uh, knowledge into this web page. So you are trying to model a person in this example. So what I mean by uh, it's not backward compatible is that if you uh, try to get RDF triples out of uh, this particular code snippet, you will not get, uh, it, it, it will give you some invalid uh, properties too. So that's one of the drawbacks uh, that we have in Mog at the moment. So if I walk, walk through uh, you in this example, uh, mainly Schemaog supports uh, five, uh, five uh, new attributes. Uh, and you can three uh, you can see three attributes uh, in this example uh, item scope item type and item prop uh, you can uh, use item type attribute to define or, or to refer to a class or a type of a particular vocabulary 
so here I'm using uh, the person class in schema of vocabulary to uh, to annotate my content. You can use item type attribute to do that. Item prop attribute uh, uh, is the next one you can see there. So uh, you can use item prop attribute to uh, refer to different properties you find inside the person class. So here I'm uh, using uh, the name, telephone, and the URL properties of person class. The item scope attribute, uh, which is the third one, you can use it to define scope of the class or the visibility of the class or the type you are using. So in this example, scheme of person, this class will be visible only within these three lines of code. It's vis visible within the outermost view tag. So that's the use of uh, item scope attribute. Uh, we already discussed uh, how we can uh, refer to a particular element of a web page uh, using RDFA, using RDFA resource attribute in the last class. So we can do the same using schema of two. There's an uh, attribute called item ID. So for an example, if you, uh, in your web page, you, if you refer to uh, this person John Doe in multiple pages and you have uh, all his uh, uh, details uh, modeled in this particular uh, section of your web page. You can use uh, item ID attribute and you can give an item ID, ID to John Doe, the person John Doe. And whenever you find uh, John Doe in your web page, web page again, you can refer to the, you can refer to this place using the item ID you created. You can use item rel tag to do that. So by using item ID and item rel, you can address uh, uh, or, or you can uh, address the problem of uh, re uh, repetitive uh, metadata uh, that uh, you probably don't need to use repetitive metadata or you don't need to uh, annotate the same content over and over again using uh, if you if you if you can use item id and item rel attributes uh, Microformats is another technique that you can use to annotate web pages. It's it's so in microformats uh, we don't have uh, very rich vocabularies to annotate uh, things using microformats as we uh, as we have with microdata. For an example, uh, we have uh, vocabularies like H card to to uh, to model. Uh, details about persons and their names, telephone numbers, and uh, things related to persons. And we have uh, H-Calendar microformat to uh, discuss, uh, sorry, to describe uh, uh, things related to calendar entries, such as dates, uh, and H-News microformat to describe news items, and we have uh, microformats to uh, describe events and uh, for an example recipes resumes so we have uh, but uh, those microformats are very limited so we have a limited number of microformats uh, and microformats does not introduce new uh, uh, new attributes to the uh, uh, new attributes to annotate uh, web resources it, uh, and it uses uh, already existing attributes. So uh, these are the three attributes that uh, it uses, class, rel, and rel. So class attribute we can use to uh, define which class or which microformat to be used. Uh, in rel attribute, uh, rel is a special attribute which we can use to uh, model the relationships uh, in anchor links or a tags in HTML. And rel, as we discussed earlier also, can be used to uh, 
define reverse relationships so or inverse relationships. So uh, the same example we have modeled using uh, microformats in this slide. So you can see uh, the class attribute is used uh, uh, when I start the new tag and uh, the text you, you can see is vcard. vcard is a, a file ex file format uh, that we can uh, that is available to store uh, business cards electronically. Uh, that's why uh, it's called vcard and uh, Actually, we are using the uh, hcard microformat here. So, fn uh, is an acronym for formatted name. So, that's how we model names in uh, hcard microformat. And tel is for telephone numbers and uh, URL is for uh, defined URL. So, the, the main point is that uh, you can use uh, to model the same example, we are using, uh, so previously we, uh, we discussed how to model the same set of uh, information using REFA, then we, we looked at how to model it using our uh, microformats, and now we see how to model that using microformats. So you can choose either of these techno uh, technologies, but they have their own uh, pros and cons, which you need to uh, decide when you are selecting your technology. So, SA REST, uh, it's a W3C member submission which was developed at Noises and uh, it's based on microformats and uh, pre um, originally it was designed to uh, annotate web, uh, web service descriptions <coughs> but uh, now we have uh, extended it to, I mean you can use use it to uh, annotate web resources as well, and we have extended it to use uh, some micro uh, micro data vocabularies like schema and annotate uh, uh, annotate web resources using uh, SRS with the help of uh, vocabularies like schema too. So, if you if you look at uh, if you look at uh, the, the different attributes uh, introduced with uh, SARX, REST, there are three main attributes, domain rel, sem rel, and sem class. So domain rel basically uh, lets us to define uh, which type of information we are going to model or which domain we, we are interested in. Uh, sem rel, is a special attribute to uh, capture the meaning of uh, an anchor link, uh, which is very similar to a uh, rel attribute in microformat. Sim class, we can use it to uh, annotate a single entity, as shown in this example. So here I'm using uh, the scheme of vocabulary person to uh, to annotate uh, this particular piece of code. So uh, here uh, you can see the use of domain rel attribute which defines uh, the uh, things uh, discussed in between these uh, two deep tags. Talks about uh, a person, that's the use of domain rel. And then you can uh, see uh, how same class attribute is used to uh, annotate each and every uh, single entity. For an example, uh, with the help of this title uh, attribute, we say uh, John Doe is the name of this particular person. In the same way, you can see uh, how to model the phone numbers and URL. So, what are and I think in chapter 5, Mary will discuss uh, essay rest in detail. So with that introduction, we, we move to uh, this slide where I try to uh, compare these technologies. So uh, I have also referred to an article in in additional reading, if you if you would like to go and read it, uh, there you will get uh, plenty of 
different properties and uh, the same technologies are being discussed uh, or compared there. So you are very welcome to go and read that too. And uh, if you look at RDFA, uh, it's the most uh, complex technology uh, from uh, the four technologies that we discussed so far because uh, it directly uh, inherits from uh, RDF and uh, as you can see the number of attributes it introduces are also high compared to the others so when you have uh, more attributes to annotate your web pages you get more expressive power at the same time uh, it complicates the technology the, it, it introduce, introduces uh, much more complex view to the technology. So, microdata and microformats were uh, introduced uh, after RDFA. That's mainly because uh, people were a bit reluctant to uh, use RDFA, mainly because it's uh, complexity compared to the uh, other technologies. So, if you look at uh, the task of annotating web pages, mainly uh, web developers does that, web, web developers do that. So uh, if, you, uh, and if you look at uh, microdata annotations, they are very similar to uh, what web developers do every day, uh, like developing web pages, you, you define the new tags, uh, you define the, their attributes like uh, tags like tr and you give uh, with then uh, so if you look at uh, how to annotate uh, things using microformat or microdata it's very similar uh, these introduce uh, new attributes and uh, you can just uh, use those to embed knowledge into this web page so or embed reading into this web page. So this is very easy way to, uh, to, to convince uh, web developers to use my creator. So that, um, that's why uh, microdata is there. Otherwise, you would think why we have uh, this many variety of technologies, even though they address the same uh, issue of annotating web pages because we have a wide variety of audience that uses those technologies. So if a knowledge, uh, if a person who is interested in knowledge representation, he would probably use RDFA, even though it's very, uh, a, a bit of uh, complicated compared to microdata and microformats. It's very easy. Uh, it, it has more ex expressive power, so you can express more things using RDFA. And can see uh, the uh, different attributes being uh, used in, uh, uh, being reused in uh, RDFA microdata and microformats, and uh, you can see uh, different target languages of those. And if you look at SA REST, it, it supports uh, it supports uh, XML, Atom, and RSS feeds too. It, so basically you can use that to uh, you uh, to annotate any resource in the web. Is there a, that's, um, I know you gave an example for the RDFA, hmm. even though it's complex, but it it's, uses very easy for some, for some concept, right. I mean, for in sorts of circumstances. Are there any times where the others might be helpful? So if you uh, so right so if you look at this example, you will not feel that. Uh, uh, so the, the example we discussed in the class, you will still feel that uh, RDFA is uh, still and still a very easy to use uh, tool com um, uh, compared with uh, with other technologies. But uh, so the. Uh, the point is, uh, 
if you if you want to introduce these technologies to a, a person like a web developer who who is pretty much familiar with uh, developing uh, web pages using the uh, tags like view and uh, using different attributes available uh, in 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 those tags like uh, so for an example a and a -shape. so person who is uh, who is trained to do things like that so these people will easily uh, they will find uh, very easy uh, I mean they will find easy to uh, use micro format uh, sorry micro data insta uh, instead of uh, RDFA because uh, the, the attributes you see are uh, very similar to the attributes that they they see in their, in, in their daily life but uh, and uh, this uh, this example is again too simple to uh, illustrate the power of RDFA so if you look at uh, this example uh, for an example uh, say uh, we have another person who uh, who who is a uh, uh, who is the spouse of this uh, person, and uh, we want to model it uh, in, in, the, uh, in the same web page. Right? So there we can use, uh, or else, right, so uh, say we have uh, another person to model, so uh, there we can uh, define another type of person, uh, like, I mean a similar structure like this, and you can uh, model that. Right? So if you go here, <coughs> and if you, if you were to define the same structure, right? uh, so uh, you, you will get another uh, uh, two deep tags somewhere around here. Uh, which says, uh, okay, uh, one limitation is you can only model uh, the attributes you, you, you see in this uh, class. For an example, if you do not see an attribute called spouse or wife in person class, you cannot model that. So if you were to extend that particular class, you, ha uh, you can do that but your extension should be approved by uh, the, uh, the set of organization, Google, Bing and Yahoo, uh, and the, uh, the groups that moderates these uh, classes to show them in, in, your, uh, in, in Google and uh, their search results. So, but uh, when you compare that with RDFA, since you can easily replace uh, that line, schema of person, with your own ontology, you can, if you do not see uh, uh, an attribute to uh, link uh, another person there as this guy's spouse or this guy's wife, you can always introduce it. You have the control over this. So that's one reason. So, and so we discussed a uh, number of new attributes uh, introduced by each and every technology and uh, the attributes uh, being used by them. Uh, the target languages, data model. So in RDFA, we have a graph model, and uh, in SAS, uh, the data model is not enforced. You can either have graph or tree, but in microdata and microformat, uh, the data model is tree. Uh, you can, uh, if, um, if you are more interested, you can go and read the uh, additional reading, which has uh, very good examples for whatever the things I discussed in this. And with that, we'll move to, uh, we'll move 
to decide which talks about different uh, an uh, tools we can use to uh, annotate our web pages. Uh, we here I list some of the research tools and uh, some commercial tools too. Um, and I have developed, uh, sorry, I have uh, listed a set of tools uh, uh, which were de which were developed uh, here at Noisy Zoo. So uh, I'll, I mean, I haven't used all the tools listed there, but uh, I have used uh, some of them. For an example, I have used Wikipedia uh, Spotlight from the research stack of tools and. Uh, Alchemy API from the commercial stack of tools, so I can uh, give you, uh, I, mean, I can explain you the differences between them. So if you want to uh, you know, uh, pick a particular tool to uh, one of your tasks, it will be helpful for you. So in Wikipedia Spotlight, uh, it, uh, it may, um, it depends a lot on context. So if, if you give it a, a, a particular, uh, I mean, uh, a bunch of text, or for an example, say a tree, and if you ask it to identify what are the entities uh, mentioned in, in that tree, it will use the, the context of which that tree is written to identify uh, entities. So, whereas in Alchemy API, it uses some, uh, some complex technologies there and there. Because uh, if you just uh, give it a random text or, or, a, or, or a name of a person like Barack Obama, it will still identify it as a person and it will give you uh, additional links uh, available on the web um, uh, which are in structured format so that you can uh, go to those links and uh, get addition, additional details about Barack Obama. Uh, so, for, for, an, uh, for a task like uh, if you want to uh, identify entities uh, mentioned in a search query, uh, I would rather go with Alchemy API than Wikipedia Spotlight because people usually uh, are very spot on when they write uh, search queries than being expressive. So, and uh, if I were to talk about uh, different tools developed at Noisy. So we have uh, developed a browser plugin called Kino. Uh, and uh, it's also, uh, we have also in integrated uh, schema of vocabularies to, do, uh, to that plugin so that you can install it in your web browser and uh, use schema of vocabularies to uh, annotate your content easily. Uh, and we have tools like Onto Ant, I think Bill is the one who worked on that. Uh, and Trido's annotator, Alan probably knows much about it. Uh, and Spoon annotator. So those are some of the tools that we developed at Noises. So you, can, you are welcome to try them too. <coughs> yeah, we, uh, that. That concludes my presentation, and I, uh, the, uh, all, all the links that I referred, and uh, the additional uh, readings are given in this, uh, these three slides. So you are welcome to go and uh, have a look at those if you are interested. So. I think uh, we really need to go through hands-on stuff. For example, we already have the tools like you know or any other thing you want to take, and actually go and do the things. You need your you should go and actually explain, uh, take a web page and go and annotate it with things and show it on involve people or give them exercise. Otherwise, just attending the presentation won't get them real uh, feeling of how it is done. So the last time I checked, you know, we had some problems with. Uh, APIs, that's why I, I, mean, I don't want to install, I mean, install it and demonstrate it because uh, we developed it uh, one year ago and uh, now the browser API has changed completely. So, certain part of Q 
you know it's not working like um, as we planned so <laughs> that's why I did not want to demonstrate it but uh, we can demonstrate uh, I think uh, a serious annotator is working the one actually we tried to yeah, yeah. So. We can demonstrate that. Uh, that we can use to annotate web pages too. Start. Okay. So. Yeah, let's start there. Okay, let's start. So let us talk about um, annotation of social data. In the first chapter, we did discuss that there are broad variety of data, right? And as you know, in the book, we have different chapters that deal with different type of data. One of the subsequent chapter will be enterprise, then we will deal with social data, then we will deal with uh, sorry, and non-textual data. These are the modalities. Within the non-textual data, you can talk about multimedia data like audio, video, images, and you can talk about other data that are like sensor data and um, signals, let's say, from uh, uh, from certain listening devices and whatever those kind of stuff that we there, right? So the objective of the, the core objective of our this course and much of the learning that we are going to do in this course is about associating meaning with the data. But for each of the different kind of data, we'll have to do something that is relevant to that particular type of data. Because fundamentally, you have to understand that data. That means you have to be able to process the data. And any tool that processes the data uh, will need to be um, you know, we would need to pay attention to what kind of data you're dealing with at many different levels. Let's just start uh, focus. Let's just focus on only textual data. Within the textual data, we have web page. A typical web page has few hundred words, and typical web page has some structure. If it's HTML web page, it has perhaps uh, something like H1 and uh, paragraph and things of that nature. It has certain things that may be bold and italics and so on and so forth. It may even be tag. In a indirect uh, form of tag is actually a href. It is tagging that with a link to something else. It's a form of tag, right? So it has some level of structure. We call it semi-structure. What if the textual data is um, just a regular article with no information? <coughs> other than it's just a file. That is type of text. Uh, you think about blog. It doesn't have a lot of structure, typically. If you want, if blog may use optionally HTML or some formatting, but it doesn't have to, right? So um, by and large, there is very little structure, if any, in that. Then you come to forums, music forum or forum where people who do uh, painkiller drug abuse go and talk. We have a project on that, right? So that has different thing. That has some structure because the forums, there are forums on different topics. They may be by dates. They may be by uh, you know uh, what kind of uh, pharmaceutical drugs you are using. That may be based on the type of experiences they are discussing. And within that itself, there may be a thing like who is the poster, what date it was posted, and so there is all this metadata. Words like metadata, annotations, these are totally, uh, they are very related. They are about the same, some nuances or in when you use. And this is a textual data also. But if you think about this, to associate meaning with that, we typically have to say, what metadata can I have? 
what kind of annotations I can do with it. Right? And so, here, suppose I created this text using a mobile device. And suppose I had my location picture on. That means that not in what you see, but if you were to actually look at the source, uh, the full information that you can get, that would have that metadata. Suppose you use mobile phone to upload a photograph on Google Plus, and you had uh, you know uh, location enabled your device, then that would capture the camera would capture the GPS based location information as well as the time from this thing and associate that with photograph. So that would be part of that metadata. Now, here, look at, at something very interesting. This itself says 121212. 12, 12. In text itself, it says a date. But this is not all that easy. How would you know this is a date? How would a computer program know this is a date? Okay. To associate the meaning with this data, knowing the time and the date it was posted is relevant. Right? That will give you some aspect of the meaning. The meaning is a big loaded word. And you get meaning in, you know, through many different types of metadata. You get meaning because you have a time when it was posted. You get meaning because it was a location. You get meaning because uh, uh, you know who posted it. You get meaning because you know who po the person who posted it is a journalist. That itself gives you meaning, right? When a tweet has actually come from the um, uh, 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 from Nick, uh, uh, who is a very well known um, uh, uh, journalist from New York Times, uh, then it gives me a context. I know Nick. I trust his work, especially anything on international affairs, because he is an author, he is a journalist on international affairs. So I, that itself is also some information that gives me the meaning associated with uh, the poster, not just the name of the poster. The, if I don't know that he is a, uh, he's a, a journalist on international affairs, but I just know he's a journalist, even then I'm likely to give higher level of trust, which is itself giving a meaning. A form. I may have a location mentioned here. I may have here. See, Georgia State is an institution. Somewhere, from uh, I can always find uh, from some other place. Either I remember or my computer can find where is Georgia State. You say, oh, Georgia State is in Kennesaw, near Atlanta, and or wherever that is. Actually, it may not be. Yeah. So, 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 so I know the location. Now, the location, there are multiple aspects of location. So, the meaning is very uh, complex here. This one, there are at least two location, locations. One is that location being mentioned here related to the event it talks about vis a vis location at which this was posted, vis a vis location of the person who posted it. This person happens to be from uh, Dayton, Ohio. That is gives me another person in data who thinks about something in Georgia State. Let's say. That gives me a meaning. So there are many different parts of location, right? They all get give meaning. In just a little short time, and without going into many more things, I just identify so many different types of data. Right? Now, um, all these data give me different meanings. In the context of Twitter data, for example, we want to, uh, in our work on Twitter, for example, and we have a number of PhD students who are doing research in this area, we do, uh, we, we associate meaning in the following different dimensions. We call it spatial, temporal, thematic. Location, te uh, temporal time, thematic, what it is about. This is a thematic thing. A key phrase is a thematic description. Then people content network. Who posted it? What are the inf what are the metadata about that person? Is person a political activist? Is pol uh, person a liberal? Uh, you know has a liberal bias. 
and, and he's talking about you know election. So I have context, right? A, or person is from a particular location. All these are metadata about person. Content, let me come back shortly. But content, part of the content related thing is, meaning this text, is the theme. Other part is sentiment, emotion, intent. Is person happy, sad, right? The many things that you could be talking about. So here is a, uh, a different. The, the, here are different properties on the uh, uh, sentiments, positive, negative, and look at this: anger, sadness, fear, surprise, joy. These are all the properties of emotion itself. Again, this is form of metadata. Intent, whether he has intent to purchase, whether he, his intent is to give, simply spread the information. Right? So now, going back to what we are discussing, we have so much information, so much metadata, all that is involved in associating meaning or in other form semantics. So now, now just let's pay attention to all the things I have covered. One thing I said is that um, you have different types of data and to associate, to analyze the kind of data, another word for that is information extraction. And a simple form of information extraction would involve, or one of the basic feature, uh, uh, capability of uh, information extraction would be entity extraction. Find out an entity being mentioned. So entity here is Georgia State or Calabasas or Hurricane Sandy. These are all entity or concerns or benefit concerns. These are all entities, right? Or concepts. So identification of concepts is that once I identify that concept or entity, that's a metadata. If that is a, that is one aspect of information extraction, right? Now, so so coming one aspect of um, this thing is uh, the type of data that we are analyzing. When you analyze type of data, just for pedagogy, um, I will divide the. Um, uh, uh, issues to be along syntax, structure, and semantics dimension. Syntax meaning dealing with aspects of playing with those characters. Right? And the words. Structure is how those words are put together. There is a structure to a tweet. It has limit to 140 character. There is a structure to a forum. There is a structure to a news article. Within that, there may be representational or formatting information. H1 is a formatting information. And then semantics. Regardless of those words and things, what is the meaning? To try and understand that this is a benefit concept for Hurricane Sandy. That is the meaning. Our brain cares about the meaning, not the syntax. Syntax is simply a vehicle. Structure is simply a vehicle to put that information, data, in, you know, information form of data in, onto something as a tweet, on a web page, all that stuff, right? But what we are after, what, why, why are we sending the tweet? We are trying to share the information. And the information is shared to convey something. That is the meaning. So our intent is always for any communication semantics. It's just that we have to take syntax and structure and understanding semantics very hard. You are learning in this course challenges in understanding getting semantics out of a whole variety of data, right? Which involves getting sense of the aspects of syntax, structure, semantics. Within then start thinking about all the things that gives you meaning, which is metadata. Metadata is stored in the form of annotation. Annotation can be very simple, uh, can, can be again uh, in another uh, uh, 
lecture we will talk about all the different kind of metadata and already in one of the lecture we talked about content dependent metadata right? right and we had content descriptive metadata so we had talked about some classification of metadata right so um, what uh, so coming back to this then for whole variety of different kinds of data now we, we talked about uh, textual data, data, but data, but also you can simply talk about all kinds of non-textual data, images and video and so on and so forth. And they have their own, um, you know, uh, uh, idiosyncrasies. So there is a, a paper that one of you is going to talk about on the metadata, right? Who is going to present the Bol uh, article, uh, Bol uh, class and my uh, book chapter on uh, metadata? Somebody else had, had taken on the job to do that, right? Okay, we'll come back to that. Somebody was going to present the whole form of metadata for different kinds of media. Uh, I covered that in the annotations after last time. Uh, did you did you cover the yeah. did you cover the uh, 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 the table uh, that we have in that chapter on the Q features for video and so on and so forth? Uh, there is a classification, as you said, based on the right. content and right. like that. But did you and go I through the different, uh, you know, metadata for different types of media? Yes. For speech meta, speech, this, you have these features and so on and so forth. Do you remember that? For uh, classification based on the media, yeah, I've covered. So, for example, suppose you look at video. Video segmentation is a structural feature. But then you say, oh, that segment, uh, this particular segment deals with somebody <laughs> scoring you know, a, a basketball, uh, you know, uh, two-pointer or three-pointer. That meaning, that is meaning, right? The syntax in that case is those pixels. The structure in that case is that ability to segment and say this is something relevant. This is an important part of this whole video. And the semantics is to be able to tag to say this particular segment is scoring, you know, in, in baseball or basketball or whatever that is, right? So, um, uh, now you hopefully, text is part of natural language and um, different, another, another totally different dimension here is that you deal with different types of text because of the syntactic and structural limitations of those languages, of those form of communication, meaning a blog or a tweet or a Facebook post or a, a news article or a scientific literature, a publication, each of them have their own nuances and because of that, one thing that varies is linguistic features. Another thing that varies is lexical features. Typically, you don't expect here uh, uh, you know things like uh, uh, periods or full points or something. You can't. You don't. You don't expect that consistent use these consistently. So you won't look for that. But if I'm uh, analyzing a uh, a news uh, piece, right? Then I expect to have a full sentence, and then I expect to have a grammar. Then I can use a parser. After doing parsing, I can tokenize it. I can do part of speech tagging. I can know what is word. I can know what is noun, phrase, right? And then, because using those kind of features, which are syntactic features, I try to get semantics, saying this is word. Player scored a goal. And I see this is a you know, relationship. And then I can look for what it means, right? So, but here you will not look for that feature. You, you would typically use parser here or not at least in the form of the uh, parser, that, not in the way that you will use parser even if you use that. Uh, on, um, uh, so so uh, here the issues are very challenging. Now uh, this is an aside, uh, not for everybody's consumption, but for example, this is the kind of thing where the PhD students look for new problems to solve. So Mina looked at this thing and said, hmm, nobody has figured out how to understand user-generated content, typically this form of user-generated content on the web, typically micro posts, micro blogs, uh, MySpace, Facebook, uh, Twitter, that kind of data. So she, um, this, 
massive amount of literature in trying to understand biomedical literature, scientific literature, and text and all that. Right? But in 2008, when she was looking at PhD topic and, and thing, she recognized that there is not much work in that area. And she became, she ended up doing the first thesis, as far as I know, in that area. So her thesis on user generated content. This is how you look for unique problem to solve, just as an aside. Anyway, so now you get a sense about different types of content, different, you know, uh, uh, aspect, you know what is syntax, structure, and semantics, uh, information extraction, metadata, annotations, and, uh, you know, the different challenges with regards to different types of data that you need to deal with. Coming back to now with all these large, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, all this aside or coverage, let's come back to the uh, reason why I started talking about that. The question was about projects. As an example, project, one can think, say, look, I have all these, um, the sum of these tweets have links. And if you click on those links, for example, I a link, and that takes me here, which has, in fact, that person took the title and put the made in tweet, but there's all this text. This text, there is a lot more material that this text gives me compared to that tweet alone. And there is video. In some cases, there will be photographs. So now the question would be, what can I do to improve my semantic interpretation understanding, which, in other words, semantic metadata, for such text by analyzing not just, so we have focused on analyzing the text here, but we are not focused on analyzing the links. So how can I improve my understanding of this and get more semantics, more metadata? What does it mean when somebody gives a link? At the, is the tweet that has link more important than the tweet that does not have link? Should I use that in ranking the results here? These links came when I clicked on Benefit Hurricane Sandy. Could I have gotten more metadata to rewrite that, uh, uh, you know, a phrase? Thus, is this a matter of trust? Does it give me more information on location and time that is not in this tweet itself? How would I distinguish between the location and time of this tweet versus something that tweet points to? Which, is, which location and time is more important? That of tweet or the event that tweet talks about? These are very difficult and interesting questions, right? So, a research project could be, a project could be then, I'm going to extend the tree trees to um, analyze um, uh, uh, the links. Then, I'm going to classify the links in different forms because this link was, see that link had video and associated text. Some link would have, so this is again on the same topic, but very different thing and lot more text. <coughs> this is entirely different, there was a live stream, which is gone now. And it's very, it is an only temporal value. After the live stream is gone, this is uh, a nuisance. This is to the same, so now there are two different tweets that is, that is to the same um, uh, source, I mean, so, so related content. What should I do? Should I, the, wouldn't that, the, doesn't that tell that, oh, these two tweets are very similar, even though that this text is very different, they point to the same thing, meaning they are trying to convey the same meaning. Are they? They are not. We don't know. Because it's possible that that, what you see, what you go here is, it has a lot of things, 
one person focus on one part of that thing, another focus on another part of that thing. For example, one may focus on big stars, while the other guy focused only on the fact that it is at certain time. They are trying to convey different meanings or you know insights for the same event that they are talking about in this way, in, in that respective ways. So that's again to the same one. This probably may, may be different. It's just Sherman Oaks. Oh well, I guess it's still going to the same one, even though one says Sherman Oaks, another says New York. So we need to understand that, right? Okay, that is Huntington, New York. So that is fine. It's probably New York. Right? So, but you you get a sense, right? People have different you know, things now. How can I figure out that the bits that had, um, um, uh, you know, that, that they were going to those particular news items or, uh, or blog had more information or more interesting information compared to this one where this is simply, uh, uh, you know, self, uh, you know, promotion kind of thing. That these are weird NJ magazine publishers who wanted to be. You know, who want to talk about their stuff, but in the larger context of things, uh, you know, of, of concert for Arigan scientific teams, this is not that much informative, perhaps. Well, again, it may depend on the context. In some contexts, it may be very informative. How would you know that? So, what I am talking about is uh, are fairly, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, so these are some of the news items. That K, that we associate with that. How can I use all these news items to understand more about that particular aspect? All this started out, by the way, with our paying attention to this key phrase: benefit, and can send you So, um, again, to summarize, a possible. I'm not advocating this, but a possible project idea is to say what can I do with information that is available through the links? Can I use it in improving my understanding of the event? Can I use it in better ranking of these tweets? Can I use it in um, uh, getting more metadata and uh, use it in some different ways? You need to think about it. Can I use it to many people talk about things that means the, the when multiple uh, li, you know, uh, tweets point to the same link, maybe that is more important content and let's just use our resources to understand that. Okay. So this is just one of, and so um, you can think about a variety of uh, projects And uh, that's not what I want. Um, so, so there are there are a whole bunch of things in um, semantic sensor web um, that that we can talk about. Kunur is a um, is another system as an example. So um, uh, Alan worked on this one, and uh, one can think about well, how can I enhance it? How can I? What what more needs to be done? These are just some examples. By no means you have to work on something that directly extends that. So here is a project uh, on. Um, I explore that uh, wind works on. Where is I explore? Somewhere here. And um, there are a lot of things that can be done here, which has a 
um, large knowledge base from something called biomedical knowledge base. So here you can start, you know, this is, there's a knowledge base and this say, okay, let us explore diabetes. And then you're exploring diabetes and um, the important point is that So the relationship, why am I not getting it? In this browser, there's some problem here. So I, I can't catch the thing. But ultimately, this relationship I extracted from uh, 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 biomedical text through information extraction, through NLP, natural language processing based information extraction. So the, again, one can conceive of, so you can talk to the people, students who are working in those areas and then say, well, what more can we do? do? They usually they will have idea of more things you can do and um, uh, anyway, that can further add to the work that they already done. And something, it can lead to a research paper, it can lead to just a report, whatever. So that is one way of pursuing what you will do. The other way you want to think is that you should go and, ahead and do some advanced reading, at least skimming through of all the book chapters and say, oh, I'm interested in enterprise data. Let's discuss them. You can discuss with me or somebody else. Uh, I'm interested in social data. I'm interested in scientific literature. I'm interested in uh, sensor data. I'm interested in uh, uh, internet of things. I'm interested in mobile applications. And then, in each of those contexts, just the same way I spent some time today discussing metadata for a social data content, we can similarly talk about metadata for sensor data, we can similarly talk about metadata for scientific literature, and so on and so forth. Each of them have their own substantial depth and nuances and complexities. Right? Typically, in any project, you're going to think about the data, you're going to think about possible applications, you're going to think about a model or ontology or knowledge base, you're going to think about uh, information extraction and annotations of the data, you're going to think about getting metadata and storing the metadata into some database, you're going to think about querying that metadata or annotations, and you're going to think about some way of using it for visual representations, browsing, searching, uh, uh, you know, uh, exploration, whatever else you mining, many of the things that you do. Right? Anybody wants to add something? Ah. Questions? Comments? All right, uh, can we stop this?